Welcome, listeners, to the Information Nation, brought to you by the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, Division of Fish and Wildlife, Hunter Education Program. As always, I'm your host, the Hunter Education Coordinator for the State of Rhode Island, Scott Travers, and I have with me... Dana Kopek who is my technical assistant who does all things editing related and helps us out tremendously here at the office. Our focus is on hunting, hunter education, fishing, aquatic education, and all things wildlife outreach related in the state of Rhode Island. We have a very special episode that I'm sure everybody's going to love this particular month. We're going to be talking with Master Falconer, Jim. And Jim, I'm sorry, but I cannot pronounce your last name if I tried. Can you please tell us what that last name is? Absolutely. Uh, Guzinski. Guzinski. Gotcha. Well, I'll tell you, it, it certainly sounds a lot better than the way I, I see it spelled. <laughs> it was a tough one. <laughs> Indeed, I didn't know yeah. my last name to the third grade. Were, I, I can imagine growing yeah. up with that name. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. So, Jim, yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from originally? I'm from Connecticut and moved here to Rhode Island back in 90, 95, 96. And have you always been an outdoor person? Uh, yeah, you know, in, in, in a, a different kind of way, I actually um, grew up doing a lot of fishing, a lot of uh, saltwater fishing. I grew up on the Byram River, and then when I was about 15, 16 years old, I started working on a lobster boat, and I did quite a bit of fishing after we'd get done fishing. Um, it was a, a lot of fun being on Long Island Sound <clears throat> during, my, uh, during my teens. And, you know, that, I think that kind of really, it dovetailed in just in, enjoying the outdoors. You know, I've always been an outdoors kind of kid. Right, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's really cool. So a master falconer, that's unbelievable. When did you first start getting interested in falconry? Actually, I was uh, at college out in Long Island, and I bumped into Mario Domenico. He's a, a master class falconer out, out on um, uh, South Hampton out that way in the Hamptons. And I just happened to bump into a, a nature center. I was uh, driving by, it was a bunch of cars. I decided to, to you know, peek my head in there. And I went in and uh, there was this gentleman, didn't really realize he was a falconer at the time. And he had a, a goshawk, he had a, a red tail hawk and a cooper's hawk. And he just spun these tales about, um, you know, hunting with these birds. And, and having that, uh, you know, a hunting bond, they're, you know, they're not pets. But it was, I found it fascinating that you, it was just such a, it sounded like such an interesting way to, you know, be able to hunt quarry, you know, hunt game. But, you know, instead of using a firearm, you're using a, a bird of prey. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So, so what's the process in getting started in something like that? You know, how, where did you go from there? Uh, you know, I moved, again, I moved to Rhode Island, uh, 95, 96. And I inquired with the, the DEM, the state, and asked if, if point in fact there was falconry. There's still a few states at that point that did not have falconry. Ken Connecticut was one of them, and West Virginia, to the best of my recollection, was you know two states that did not still have falconry regulations in place. Uh, Rhode Island, uh, I believe, got their regulations in place in 92, so not too far after uh, when I had called, um, or too far before. Um, and essentially, there, there's a process to it. You have to find uh, a sponsor who's willing to sponsor you. Uh, best case scenario, you can get out, do some hawking. The problem was when I was in Rhode Island uh, at the time there, there wasn't any falconers really that could sponsor me. So my first sponsor was out of Cape Cod. Um, so I had to drive. It was a good, long, solid two-hour ride. And you have to spend time with your, your sponsor. That's state and federally. Uh, mandated, if you will, it's, right. it's part of the regulations. Yeah. So, how much time? How many hours did you have to put into that? Oh, uh, you know, I to quantify it'd be tough, but it, quite a bit. I mean, you know, I every Saturday I would I would go up and and make that trip. Uh, they don't have Sunday hunting on Sunday, so you can't hunt your birds. Um, so I what I would somewhat learn as a you know first year apprentice on it. I'd say a weekend or a Saturday with my sponsor, I would try and duplicate on a Sunday, say and just spent as much time in the woodlot as I could. Um, you know, and trying to find the habitat and, and where to go for these, for, you know, for rabbit and squirrel, namely, with, with the two quarry that, you know, you're pursuing with a red tail. Gotcha, so that, that's yeah. going to be the two, two target species for you. Yes, yes, for red tail. Right. You know, other birds, you know, different quarry for sure. Um, gotcha. So, yeah. so how many different types of birds can you you know work at a time or, or own at a time well you know 
again, there's there's a lot to it. So an apprentice, you have a red tail. Mm -hmm. You're you're that that's the bird of prey that you're allowed to use for falconry. So, um, so it always starts with a red tail. It does. It does. And then as you move on to a general level, uh, you're a general five years. You're an apprentice two years. Um, with that, I, you know, I should kind of backtrack a little. You know, when you are in a, uh, before you even get to that point of being an apprentice and having a sponsor and, and grabbing, uh, trapping a bird, um, you have a test that the DEM makes you take, uh, which is a good thing. It's, you need an 80% or better. Um, you have to build a chamber, which is called a muse, not to be mistaken with, you know, the muse that's in Wakefield. Um, <laughs> right. But, you know, so you have to build a chamber, get your equipment, uh, a DEM official, uh, Sarah, uh, O'Reilly is usually uh, the person that does that. She'll come to the premises and make sure that all those things are in place. Um, the sponsor during that is helping, you know, the apprentice study for the test and get the equipment they need and, and even, like, make sure that the, the chamber is built um, to specifications that they need. Right, and the chamber, just so our listeners know, that's where the bird actually resides. Absolutely. Yeah, um, usually... Eight, eight feet cube, but uh, you know you probably want to go eight by ten. You know it's it's a big outdoor chamber for the bird. Um, you're doing a lot of manning inside with the bird first when you're first trapping them, but that's you know that's essentially where the bird you know needs to um, reside. You know that's that's the best place for him is in the chamber. Gotcha. Yeah. So now, how about during the winter months? Does the does the bird still stay outside? Yeah, yeah, not as much. Um, you know, weight management is a big part of, of falconry. So um, what, I, what I'll do is, you know, you have the bird inside um, prior to a hunt. And what you're doing is you're, you know, you're, you're able to, you know, manipulate the bird's weight. It, it's, it's a weight management. Um, it, there's a lot that goes into the weight management of the birds. Essentially, if they're too heavy, they're not going to want to hunt. They're not sharp enough to hunt. They're too low. Um, you know, you want them to be in the best shape that they can be. So if they're too low, you can get a, a, a decent hunt out of them, but then they're going to run out of gas. So you have to maintain those birds and, and their health, and a big part of that is, point in fact, their, um, their weight. Um, and, you know, we have a part of it is a, is a scale. You know, we weigh our birds. Uh, a, a perfect example is a bird red tail that I had last season, you know, flew about 36 ounces. If that bird got to the point of 40 ounces it'd, it'd be too heavy like you wouldn't even want to fly the bird what you're not going to have is field control you're going to have a bird that will bump on you um and just not tolerant as tolerant of the hunt if you will so you really have to you know you zero in on their on on their their weight management right and that that's pretty critical i mean just from 36 to 40 ounces that's you know pretty yeah. close tolerance it, it is um you know and it's it's it is pretty precise. At the same time, you know, it's it's a reward based system. So you're, they're also getting used to routine. You know, we use a, a lure, um, tidbits, and a whistle. Whistle is great, especially if you've been running around. Um, you know, and, and and try and whistle naturally. It's sometimes it's not going to happen. So these these whistles will actually recall your bird. You can get your bird if it really starts to take off on you. What happens sometimes is you'll have wild resident red tails come in when you're hunting and sometimes they'll, they'll kind of chase each other and what they'll do is it's called crabbing they'll actually kind of grab each other Let, you know there's been a few times i've broken up a uh, a red tail street fight wow they'll, no kidding yeah they'll, you know they'll kind of tangle up come down to the ground and you're you're separating two two red tails um and if it goes the other way where your bird chases um a resident bird that's that's what's important about the lure and the whistle. You whistle, you get that lure out, you swing it. Bird usually, if you've trained them right, they'll you know they'll do a really quick turn, come around, and come back to you and the lure. Uh, so it's it's another part of the training that goes into actually applying to the hunt. You know, when you're out there doing it. Oh, wow, that's really yeah. neat. Yeah, so, so you start out with the red tail, mm -hmm. and then where do you go from there? Do you stay with the red tail? or I'd imagine some people probably yeah. do. Yeah, you, you absolutely can. It, it, it basically depends on the challenge mm -hmm. that, that you want and, you know, get out of your comfort zone. I, I absolutely love red tails. Um, as far as Rhode Island, the quarry, habitat, loss of habitat, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's nothing. Red tail, the best way I could say it is they're like a, a pickup truck. 
they're just reliable. You know, you go out, you hunt, and you, you put game in the bag. Um, they're excellent on rabbit and squirrel. Goshawks, Porsche hen, uh, Porsche hen to falconry. They're temperamental. Uh, a, a really, you really have to be good with your weight management. Um, their metabolic rate is just they're at a different level. They're, they're just a constantly running engine, whereas wow. a red tail can kind of slow down um, and, and almost fast, you know, if you will. Um, but what you get out of a goshawk is what we call fur and feather. So you can hunt uh, with the female. The females in the bird of prey world are bigger. Uh, the female, you want a bigger bird or goshawk uh, if you're going to, f uh, say, hunt squirrel, rabbit, and duck. You need something bigger that can manage that and, and hunt duck. And certainly squirrel. Squirrel have a good bite. So you need a female that's got bigger feet. Right. It can actually, you know, um, not be at the receiving end. Of, of you know a hunt like that so that being said goshawks are absolutely incredible as far as a falconry bird what's neat about them is they're so fast you can hunt them from the glove so you can actually um sneak up on you know like a little creek where there's duck and you can actually have the bird take off from the glove wow whereas you know red tails you're using the advantage of trees mm -hmm. um, and then you know you can get into the other parts of it uh, merlins are great uh, kestrels are, are wonderful. They're, there you can, you're hunting sparrow, starling. Any farmer, usually any local farmer around here would appreciate a starling or a, uh, uh, you know, a kestrel or a merlin hunting, you know, their, their farm to take care of the, the various starling and sparrow, you know, that are in their barn. Um, you know, there's, there's guys out west that hunt with golden eagles. You know, we, we don't. Um, you need a lot of space, and right. it can be dangerous. There's just there's yeah, so many gotcha. people and small dogs running around here. Yeah. Right. So yeah. now, do you have contact with a lot of uh, farmers and and people like that in the area? Yeah, yeah. You know, there's what's nice about the sport is, you know, you have people that are um, they just don't want it. I hate to say it, they don't want a, a deer hunter on their property, but they're okay with say a falconer. Um, so you know, I have access to, you know, a lot of private property for that. And, and farms as well um, with with the falconry license and and practicing the sport I, I would say you do have access to uh, I would say some really neat areas you know people really open up their their yards to you and their, their property which is great yeah, yeah yeah well so now um, what's the season for the various types of game that you pursue well we're the same as a small game season uh, October through February if you're, you're, you know, you're hunting, uh, you know, small game. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're smart about it, you really enjoy the sport and you want to hunt outside the season, what you can certainly do is is trap yourself a kestrel, trap yourself uh, a merlin, and hunt off season, so you can hunt the, the non-protected species. Gotcha. So you can hunt those those species as long as you want. The the, the catch to it is the birds do molt, so as a, a snake will shed its skin uh, these raptors are actually dropping feathers so each so a perfect example is the red tails that we trap have a brown tail with darker brown barring that's their first year morph if you will we do not trap a red tail that has a red tail so during that first year they have a different set of tail feathers and their second year through that summer they actually drop they molt those immature tail feathers and other primaries too. Mm -hmm. um, and in comes the actual red tail. So when we're looking to trap a bird, um, we're always looking for the brown tail on a red tail, not right. a red tail on a red tail. The big thing to that is you're looking at a 70 to 80% mortality rate with these raptors. So we're, what we're doing is they've kind of beat the odds and they're part of the breeding population. You know, the actual red tails that have matured and molted and, and now have an actual red tail, which is e an easy way to trap. You know, you, you look up in the trees, oh, you know, what is it? And the bird turns around or, you know, you glass the bird and you say, oh, it's, it's got a brown tail. We can trap it. It's got a red tail. We can't. Right, right. Yeah. So now what time of year is that? Um, you usually, you, you know, you start to look around September. Uh, some guys will go August. Uh, it's really tough to find the birds because there's so much cover. There's still so much foliage. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I actually prefer a later trap bird. 
you know, you get a bird. I mean, you're, you're losing part of your season. Uh, it takes about a month to really get a bird from trap to woodlot and hunting, which really isn't long when you think of a, a wild bird. Yeah. Um, so, so how long does that training process take once you actually have the bird? I would say a, a, a solid month. So really? Yeah. That's all? Yeah. Yeah. The, it, you know, it's all, again, it's that reward-based system. Um, you're getting the bird to man down on the glove. Uh, you, then you get the bird used to just human activity and then and then kids and dogs and just all you know all the things that go on in a household and then what you do is you start to incorporate a whistle you get the you put the bird on a perch and you get the bird to jump to you after it's eating readily off the glove then you transition to the you know a perch you put the bird on it and you take a step away and you get the bird to try and take a jump or a small flight to you and what you do is you simply increase that distance and you get the bird to fly farther and farther to you and then you take that outside all the while you you know you're managing their weight all the while uh and then you bring the bird outside you throw the bird on what's called a creance which is just a long leash and you're using the whistle then you start to use the you know the lure as well and you're getting that bird to come again farther to you and farther to you and then you best place is soccer field you don't want the the creance to get snagged or anything um and you, again, you're using the whistle, you use the lure, you get that bird to come to you about 100 feet. Essentially, you know the bird's ready when you're, you're moving away from the bird and you can hear their bells. We, we put these falconry bells on them um, so we can hear them in a woodlot. If they go down on quarry, you can hear them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a way of locating our birds. Guys also use telemetry. Um, and essentially, once that bird is coming towards you, uh, you can hear them. They're, they're already anticipating the call. So before you can even turn around and present the glove for the tidbit when they're on the creance, that bird's already coming to you, you're, you're ready. And essentially, you take that creance off. You go to one of your uh, honey holes that you have for rabbit or squirrel where, you know, you really can almost guarantee that the bird's going to see quarry because they're not always going to, they're not going to get it immediately. You know, you put them up in the tree and they're kind of like, all right, well, what's going on here? So what you're doing is you're, you're trying to set up the best hunting scenario you can. So you, you put the bird up and you just start beating brush for your bird. Um, you know, like I've said before is, you know, falconers are a cross between a beagle and a refrigerator with legs. Huh. You know, I mean, they really make that, that association after a while. You really get a, a, you know, I've had a few red tails that were really dynamite for five years. And, I, you know, I held on to them just because they were easy to manage and they were awesome in the field. You know, some birds you get that are really high strung um, and hard to manage. You, you know, you, you, you're trying to get a Jess on them or, you know, the gear and they're trying to foot you. They're just a high strung bird, but they're excellent hunters. Right. And then you have birds that are really easy going. You put them up in a tree and they kind of look at you like, all right, well, you, you know, I'm, I'm not too sure I want to do this. The few birds that I've had that I carry over for a few seasons are both. They're easy to manage and handle and they're dynamite in the in, in a woodlot cool and that's just, you, then you just start you start beating brush and then they start making that connection you know you get that hunting bond where they know what you're doing and what to expect and then the reward is when when the bird does make a kill you you reward the bird with the quarry you know so you give them a part of the rabbit or squirrel and that's that's you know kind of seizing the moment where it's it's actually teaching the bird we do this you get that Gotcha. They really, it really does. They start to make that correlation. You know, yeah. Second, third year, they're really, it's pretty. It's a pretty streamlined system. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so you mentioned a couple of terms there. Uh, a creance. What's that? Uh, it's like a really long leash. Okay. That's essentially, it. Uh, you know, you use something pretty light like parachute cord, mm -hmm. and we use just a swivel, and you know, you're you're attaching that uh, that leash to their jesses, and the jesses are a way that we are able to hold on to the birds. Um, you know, when you see them on the glove, you know, I'm sure some people have seen at least the picture of a, a bird of prey on the glove. They're holding the, the jesses, and the jess is attached to a leash. Gotcha. And, and that jess would be like a... It's, uh, well, we use kangaroo leather. We actually make oh, a lot wow. of our own gear. Huh. And then the anklet is the part that goes around the tarsus, so the tarsus being the leg okay. of, of the, uh, the bird. And we have grommets, and then you feed the, the jess through the grommet, and there's a button. And that's that's kind of the stopper, but then the jess continues through, and then you're able to hold on to the bird okay. through through the the, the jesses. So then with the creance is you just attach this long leash to the right. jesses. Right, and and that doesn't hinder the bird in its flight or in its its pursuit. No, 
No, it, it really doesn't. Um, not that I've seen. You know, you a lot of the gear. I'm I'm pretty. I'm, I'm a minimalist with that stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'll go with really small, light jesses, anklets, as well as bells. You know, I use these really small bells. A, a gentleman, Dave Noble, makes them. My favorites. There's others, uh, bell makers out there, but they're absolutely fantastic. Wow. Yeah. So, so how long do you keep a bird for, or how long would a bird be active for? Well, uh, active for that hunting season, mm -hmm. and then as far as seasons go, you know, once you put the bird up for the molt, the end of February, um, you the bird's put up for the molt. Um, but y you know, it, as far as a really good bird, I've held on to about five seasons. You know, birds like anything else. You know, there's some really good birds that just have a natural talent to work with the falconer, if you will. And right. some birds are just duds. So those birds, you know, if the bird's really bad, I'll actually, and it's still early enough, I'll release the bird and try and get another bird, per se. Mm -hmm. Not really, but that, that, that is an option. Um, so essentially, if the bird really didn't work out, I'll just toss it back to the wild at the end of the hunting season, yeah. which is which great. And that's... That's something that you know I really need to, to note is uh, say is Rhode Island the, the DEM and the falconry program here in the state of, of Rhode Island is one of the best. I mean we rival Maine, and by that I mean just falconry friendly where they the birds we're allowed to use what they allow us uh, access to for birds, and and the regulations in and of themselves is is absolutely excellent. For example, Connecticut, they not, the falconers can't trap birds in Connecticut, so they have to go to nearby states like Rhode Island and New York to trap their birds for falconry. Hmm. Rhode Island is they they basically threw everything in, but the kick you know the kitchen sink, if you will, for falconers. And there's only seven of us. There's only seven of us in the state. So, um, and you know, and how many are actual master falconers? There's one other. Jack okay. Billings, who was a, um, a former apprentice of mine, when he was my apprentice at the time, he was from he was a Massachusetts falconer, um, and then he moved back to Utah for a few years, and then when he made his way back to the East Coast, he, he ended up staying here in uh, Rhode Island. I think now he's a, a Newport police officer. Gotcha. Yeah. So there's only two of us. Well. Yeah, the rest are generals, and then that's it. I think the rest are all generals. Oh, so we need some apprentices we now do. coming up. Yeah, we yeah. Sure do. Well, hopefully we get the word out a little bit. We'll get some yeah. interest going. Yeah. So yeah. So, but when when we consider this uh, something like becoming a falconer, I'd imagine that's a very serious commitment that you know you have to really you know understand. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think that the commitment part is, um, it's. I don't think anybody really can anticipate how much is going to go into it. And, and I think that's really the importance of the sponsor again. You know, that's what's great, again, about the sport is that sponsorship, any, any sponsor worth his salt or her salt, because there are female falconers out there, is they, they hold their apprentice, you know, they, they hold their feet to the fire. You have to. They're not pets. Yeah. You know, when I, when I take on an apprentice, I, I really, through the years, you know, it's been 27 years I've been doing it. You know, each apprentice... You, you, you kind of I have a, the same speech but a little different. Um, essentially, what I, I say is you, I find out that you're not flying your bird or you're avoiding my phone calls or um, I don't spend the time with you that I need to spend with you so I can observe you as the falconer and the bird and see collectively how you're doing with with your bird. I'll drop you if I find out you're just sitting on a bird. Right. These, these birds are they're meant to hunt, be hunted with. Yeah. Yeah. They have to stay active. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so how many apprentices have you had over the years? Wow. I'd say probably at this point close to a dozen. Uh, not all from Rhode Island. Uh, a couple of Massachusetts guys. Uh, Connecticut. When Connecticut first got legal, um, there was a gentleman, John D'Arpino and Kevin Boussoulet. They were my, uh, probably one of my first apprentices. Uh, Vivian Maxson. Uh, she's down in Bradford. Um, there's been quite a few. I'd say... I'd say about a dozen. Well, which again, it's it is a, a commitment, you know, on the sponsor's part too. Oh, right, on everybody's yeah, part. Yeah, and, and their part. You, you, you really have to uh, put that time into the apprentice too. A lot of them come into it; they, they have no idea. They have an idea, but then when you actually have the bird, and then you figure out the commitment that goes with it, then it it, it can be a little bit daunting. 
And like I said, I've always said to my my apprentices that just just give it everything you have. But you become a pet keeper, then it, I will make the phone call to the state. Like, yeah, this isn't working. That's not happened yet. Um, and really, just like anything, you really get some real talented apprentices out of it. And what's neat is, like you were saying, is at least that you know the sport continues. You know, when you think about it, right? You know, it's about four thousand years old altogether. And yeah. th- some of the things that we're doing now, you can read in books. Frederick the Second has a book uh, came out, I think, in the twelfth century. And there's a lot of things that he speaks about in this book that are absolutely applicable now. Well, it's fantastic. Twenty two. I mean, wow, it's, it's incredible. So, there's, and that's what's neat about sponsoring you know some of these apprentices is you they're carrying a torch so it, it, it'll hopefully continue on here in Rhode Island right absolutely yeah yeah so so we talked a little bit about um trapping a bird and mm-hmm. getting a bird can mm-hmm. can we talk a little bit about like what what was that like you know how do you trap that bird yeah uh, it's absolutely exhilarating I you know the first time you have a bird on the glove it's it's such a long haul to get there and rightfully so there's a lot of hoops you got to go through through the state through the sponsor all good is it it's almost surreal you know all of a sudden you have this bird right in front of you um and it's it there's, there's quite a bit that that goes in it we use a bc which you know it's kind of like a dome it's a cage and it's got um nooses on it and we'll we'll put like a rodent in there and use that for bait and essentially the bird you, you spy a red tail you go by you kind of you don't try to stop the vehicle you kind of go real slow you toss the bc out and hopefully by the time you you turn around and start coming back the bird's coming down on the on the bc and what they're trying to do is they're trying to get at the mouse so they're trying to foot the mouse and what they're doing is hopefully they're putting their you know their foot through one of those nooses and as they come back on it the noose you know cinch up on them and the minute you kind of see them pulling at their leg a little bit you run in sometimes they fool you you know you jump out of the car you go to get the bird and the bird takes off on you. <laughs> off they go yeah <laughs> yeah um but you, the, the best case scenario is you, you have you have a red tail sitting there we also use um pigeons uh, we make a pigeon harness and again the harness it's kind of like a leather jacket the wings come through the sides it, there's a bunch of nooses on it so the bird comes in on the pigeon tries to get at the pigeon and, and again gets fetched up that's attached to a line you know, with the weight on it so they can't fly off with the pigeon. And then there's dogazas, which is basically, dare I say, it's almost like a gill net. You know, it's, it's just a wall of, of, of net, and you have the bait, whatever it may be, behind it. Um, and the bird is trying to get to the bait and essentially gets Just flies into it. Yeah, yeah, just gets caught up like a fish. So there's a few methods. And then it's knowing where to go. Red tails, you can see them in, you know, on the side of a road. Uh, you know, you don't want to do it on 95 and, you know, potentially get hit. <laughs> so, and you know what? The safety of the bird's a big part, too. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you also want to be, you know, indiscreet about it. You don't want to do it in the middle of just anywhere, you know, you, because you could see where, you know, some people might take offense to it. So, you know, we try to be pretty low-key about it. And you, red tails, they're, dare I say, they're almost everywhere. Uh, you know, you, you want Merlin's. You go to different places for that. Peregrines, beach, you know, they're using the eastern seaboard essentially to Mm -hmm. migrate out of the tundra and Greenland and parts north. So different areas for different birds. And and kind of all the same, you know, you could use all those methods of trapping, as I said. Some are just more effective for certain species of bird, just like fishing. Right. Certain baits work better for certain species of, of fish right yeah you have to go where they are right. and you have to know what to use to attract them exactly yeah exactly oh that's really neat when you hunt with your bird do you usually hunt solo or do you or is there another falconer with you that you work with in pairs or yeah uh, both really it you know it's it can be really anything you want it, it depends on the falconer you know whether he or she is more of a recluse or not. The bottom line is, as an apprentice, you're definitely going with your sponsor. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I you know, I I have good friends down in New Jersey. I have really good friends up in Maine. And what, what it, what's nice about the sport is the privilege of, of flying with these birds, but then choosing. There's some days you just want to go yourself. You want to be in a woodlot by yourself with your bird and, and take it all in. 
And then there's times, um, yeah, you know, I go with a, a bunch of my former apprentices. Um, you know, there's a, a Steve Knott, Steve Wood, former apprentices of mine. Um, and as, as best we can, we try to get together, you know, in, in, in the busy life that we all lead. We try to at least get together once a week, if, if not more. And what is good about going with other falconers is you, you have someone that can watch your bird while, say, you're going into some brush, while you're being the beagle. Um, I've climbed trees, so, you know, you, you kind of climb a tree to get something moving at times. You, again, you're the beagle. Um, by the time I get down out of the tree, the bird's gone. You know, it's, it's already chasing the quarry. It's good to have someone else, you know, yeah. follow the chase, if you will. Yeah, right. Um, and it, it is. It's, it can be a social thing, too. What's also good about going with other falconers is even you know, myself is learning from other falconers. You know, their techniques, you know, equipment. You know, everybody has a nuance to what they do with their birds and how they handle them and, and the equipment they use. Especially the younger guys, um, they, they're, they're more in tune with new things that are coming up and coming. Whereas, you know, I'm probably more old school than that but that's okay you know what it, it gives you is a, is a good range of where things are are going or where they are and, and some of the stuff is pretty neat which is like telemetry mm -hmm. um, gear you know guys are using different kinds of, of you know leather at times you know there's just leashes there's you know just the way you know all those things come together and then like i said and then watching how various falconers handle their birds yeah right it just makes everybody better in it the does. long run yeah it does you know, it keeps you on point. It keeps your former apprentices on point. Uh, we did have meets. There's meets occasionally. Uh, Massachusetts usually gives, um, you know, really good field meet. They put on a really good field meet. I haven't been to one in years. But uh, back in the day when I was essentially kind of the, well, it was a point, I was essentially the only falconer, practicing falconer in the state. I spent a lot of time up in Mass hunting with, you know, Massachusetts falconers. Gotcha. Now, do we have one of those field meets here in Rhode Island? We don't. You know, we're it's, it's only seven of us, and it'd probably be a good idea to someday have one. What we do, we don't have, like, an official meet, but there have been times where we all kind of get together. Uh, Jack and, and a couple of his former apprentices, myself and my my former apprentices, you know, we'll all kind of get together and, uh, you know, do some hawking together. Not everybody's... You know, bird is ready that day, so everybody just kind of throws a bird up, and you beat brush for, you know, the falconer and the bird, and and then hopefully the bird gets something. You know, you have some quarry in the bag, and then the next guy goes. You know, yeah, gotcha. Throws his bird up, and you get to watch another red tail fly. And they all, they're all different. You know, they're males and females. Males, they they're a little zippier. They they recover, a after chasing usually faster. But the females, they're bigger, so they can crash brush. They can really, you know, penetrate in a briar and get to a rabbit or a squirrel. Mm -hmm. So there's different met methods that these birds will use based on their size. You can actually see how they pick how they're going to hunt the bird themselves. It's pretty wild. That's cool. You know, yeah. They kind of pick a slip. Um, the, the older birds that you've been hunting with for a while, they're a lot more precise. They, they rarely miss. You know, those first year birds are a little sloppy. They're a little goofy. Um, you get them... You hold them over for the second, third year. Each year, they just get better and more mm -hmm. proficient, and more efficient with the falconer per se. Right, which now, is pretty wild. Yeah. No. Um. You, you mentioned going to different places or people from different states. Mm -hmm. Um. Like when you go hunting or fishing, you have to get a fishing license or a hunting license mm -hmm. in each individual state. Is it the same way with falconry? It sure is. Yeah. 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 You, uh, different states, different uh, ways of doing that. Maine is awesome. So Maine. Um, you can you buy your hunting license, but you can also buy your falconry license. And what's really neat about Maine is a reciprocity. There's a few states that have reciprocity, meaning you can come into my state, and this is more for trapping and taking a bird. Mm -hmm. And we say a falconer from Maine can come down to Rhode Island if they wanted and trap a red tail, which they probably wouldn't have to do, but if they wanted to, they could. And vice versa, I can go up to Maine and trap a bird up in up in Maine. Um, so that those lights, you absolutely need a license if you're going to go up and hunt in any mm -hmm. state or down. Say you go down to Jersey, get your hunting license. Usually when you get that, that hunting license, some states allow you to get a falconry license as well. So Maine, when I was first practicing falconry here in the state of Rhode Island, there wasn't a whole lot for birds. You were only really allowed um, a red tail and a kestrel. And I worked with Paul 
Ricard, but certainly back then was Mike Lepisky. And he, he na enabled me to at least get some more birds of prey on the regs that allowed us to trap and work with other birds. I basically was like, hey, you know, I mean, I'd like to try some other birds and not just right. be, you know, sanctioned to just a red tail or a kestrel. Now, the regs we have now are absolutely wonderful. Paul Ricard was a huge part of that, um, the regulations we have now. And, you know, those regs have, they, they really, they make falconry really pleasurable here in the state. But to answer your question, yeah, you know, you, you have to have all those things in place when you go in, you know, to harvest or, you know, chase quarry around another state. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, now, do the same uh, rules apply uh, with asking landowner permission and everything? Yeah. Well, you know, usually what it is is when you go to a state, you're relying on the other falconers. They're hosting you. Okay. So they, they kind of tell you where to go or where they're going is where they've hunted and yeah we try to not get in too much trouble with that kind of stuff you know it, it, because we really enjoy flying these birds and they they pull your license from you i mean that's it I mean, yeah I, I don't know what i would do without falconry yeah and see that that sounds like a great you know opportunity uh, you know to build up friendships and relationships um as opposed to being you know a solitary person out there you know i, I know when people hunt in other states you go, you might rent a cabin, you know, or something, or you might know of a, of a public woodlot that you could go to. Um, but it sounds like with falconry, you're really going there to meet up with somebody else who's going to help show you the places to go to in that area. Absolutely. That's a great point. I, I, you know, that's a really interesting point. I never really thought of it that way, and you're absolutely right. Yeah. It, it's, um, you know, I have a great friend uh, who just passed actually a couple of weeks ago, Mark Fanning, 76, they, they called him, they deemed him the godfather of falconry up wow. there. And he, he and his wife uh, hosted me. I'd, I'd go up there and essentially we'd watch, you know, their Jure Falcons, Peregrines, fly on salt marsh up there. And he was the first falconer in the state of Maine to do that. I think he did that in 72, 73. Wow. He basically was flying these long wings over salt marsh on mallards and black duck. And... The friendship that I, I gained from the both of them was, it, and what they taught me about falconry has been awesome. Uh, and that's, like you said, I mean, that's what's great about the sport is you, you are, you, when you're going to these states, you know, these falconers are hosting something, uh, and or you, you know, you go up, you visit a falconer, and they're, they're taking you, you know, to their wood lots, to their salt marsh. Uh, they're showing you the ropes. Uh, same thing with New Jersey. I have two really good, uh, great friends, Phil and Paul, Aliyah down there. And, you know, they're great hosts. You go down there and you basically fly, fly your birds. And they're like, all right, we're going to go here and then we're going to go there. And they usually take you to their better spots, to their honey holes. Right. You know, yeah. um, but that, you're right. It's, it really is a great facet of the sport. So I know for certain groups, like um, people who fly fish in Rhode Island, we have United Fly Tires of Rhode Island, um, Trout Unlimited, and there are different organizations um, around the state so do you have um a falconry association we do it's uh the rhode island falconers guild and essentially you know we don't put meets on we don't meet as a as a club or a guild if you will uh we're all pretty independent in in our pursuit of falconry what we do though is we come together when certain things need to get done you know through through the state we were fortunate enough to get a, a peregrine take last fall for the first time in Rhode Island uh, history. They took the peregrine falcon off the endangered species list in 99, and I think uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service allowed falconers to start trapping passage tundra peregrines in 2004. So it's taken some time, but Rhode Island, we're, we're on, you know, we're on the board now. We're, we get a allotment of two birds that we can trap, and I trapped one last fall. For that, I, you know, got the guys together and said, hey, this is, is something that I think really, th this is pretty much the end of the line as far as the regs go for the, the, the state because we have awesome regs again. And I'm sure there's some other things that we could tweak, but not really. Uh, but the peregrine take was really the last of it. And we do have a peregrine take now, which is really cool. Um, so we got together for that. So we all... They all came over the, the, the house, and we, we sat down. I, I'd already been writing letters to the state and uh, was going between Jay Ostinkowski and you know some other people there at the DEM, Sarah O'Reilly, and 
they did every, they did the legwork to make it happen, but there was a lot of paperwork I had to do on my end. You know, I had to write the state and say, hey, this is my intention, and how can we go about this, and this is why I think that Rhode Island Falconers should have access to Peregrine Falcons. And as a club, as a guild, we came together for that. And then we kind of dispersed and went, went our own way after, but that, that's there, though, now. You know, we're, we have in our state regulations that you can trap a peregrine falcon. Yeah, see, I, I think that's really, really fantastic, and for a bunch of reasons, too. Like, you guys are a loosely affiliated association, but when it, it comes time for something really important, you all come together, you're a united voice, and while you might not be, you know, 500 falconers in mm -hmm. Rhode Island, with the limited numbers that you do have, you all come together together and you know bring that point home to actually affect and change the legislation in place you know to make it what it should be absolutely yeah yeah well said yeah. I mean, absolutely and let's face it you, you know people i think falconers in general are pretty strong-minded you know we, we can all butt heads once in a while but the bottom line is we're all looking out for each other when it comes to some you know to, to regulations and enhancing falconry in the state which again um, we're, we really do have a great state, and we have great DEM officials that were open to it. We, we weren't met with a wall. Right. Uh, New York State will never get a peregrine take. You know, there's a lot of politics that go behind that stuff. And I can't say that for Rhode Island. They, they, all the officials I've, I've worked with, Paul Ricard, Paul Ricard, uh, he and I sat down quite a bit because the feds turned falconry reg over to the state they basically said we you there's a deadline and you you need to fit the, you need to get all your regs approved by the department of interior and if you don't your state loses your falconry and paul ricard and i i mean he was absolutely fantastic we sat down we went over things he you know he he'd send me copies of the regs he was working on what do you think uh what can we change here he he listened and a big part of that uh, I, he said, well, what state? And I said, I said, Maine, go to Maine, see what they're doing with their regulations, their regulations, their Falcon regulations are awesome. And, and it, it was nice to be listened to where he yeah, said, right. Hey, yeah, let me, and I know he, he tapped into a few other States and it's not to beat up on Connecticut, but you, there's nothing to draw from Connecticut because their Falcon regulations are almost non-existent in the sense that they're allowed to hunt their birds but they can't trap any of the birds. They're not allowed goshawks. Right. They're not allowed certain species of birds to be flown. Here in Rhode Island, the sky's the limit, really. They, they allow us to trap and train a variety of species of birds, which is awesome, because that's what the sport's about, too, is, hey, you know, I'm, I think I've learned enough. I've mastered a part of red tails. I want to move on to a harder bird, a goshawk. Yeah, so you want to it's advance there. yourself, yeah. Exactly. Right, yeah. And, yeah. and you know, every state is different, and it's like that with legislation pertaining to all different types of mm -hmm. things. You know, we're just fortunate that in Rhode Island, we just have a great state where we have these opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah, I really, I can't say enough about the DEM. I, I know you guys can take your lumps sometimes, but man, I, I've had nothing but pleasant experience with, with the biologists and, and, and the folk that were leaning in on the regs that basically were affecting us but they were kind enough and open-minded enough to listen to us to yeah. listen to falconers you know we're the ones that are living and breathing it you know yeah, every right. day and you know we're with these birds every day yeah, um, yeah. you know you care for them uh, it's an everyday thing you know even when they're molting you're still feeding them you're going in that chamber every day you're giving them a quail you're giving them part of what they you know or some quarry that they hunt they you know they got during the season you know you're getting that back to them, you know, whether it's rabbit or squirrel, and that's what they're eating during their molt. Uh, you're supplementing them with some quail too in between. But the bottom line is, is we're doing this every day. That it's not, unless you don't have a bird. Um, but if you have a bird that you intend on hunting with, um, and and you, you're enjoying it, like I said, like a red tail, that I had you know, about five years there, um, you have that bird for the molt. And you're going in, and while you're going in there, what's neat? I mean, the, the most interesting part is taking a you know, a molted feather off the ground. Um, there's really not much that goes, you know, there's not a lot going on with the bird, but you're, you are looking, you know, you're, how are the talons? You know, are they, they, they sharp enough? Is she bathing? You know, we usually put a, you know, there's a bath pan in there that they could take, a, you know, a bird bath in. Right. Um, so you're, you're constantly assessing the birds. Be, the one thing about falconry is anything that can go wrong will go wrong. 
there's just so many variables, whether you're hunting and whether the birds themselves. You, so you're, you're constantly overlooking, you know, you're assessing your bird. Anytime you're handling your bird, like how does everything look? Does the gear look yeah. good? You know, is there, you know, does the leash look good? Um, because again, anything. Anything that can go wrong will. Yeah, that's, that happens in yeah, a lot of areas of life. Of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah gotcha. Um, and they're in your care. Mm -hmm. So you're ultimately responsible for them. Right, yeah. So no excuse, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, usually we ask uh, towards the end of the podcast for some funny story from the field. <laughs> so I'm really interested to hear what type of story you have for us today. Well, you know, I think humor is a tough one to, to get across unless you're a stand-up. <laughs> but, I, you know, the, the best I could say to this is, you know, when we're out there chasing these birds, and it probably won't convey as funny as it is because it's one of those – things that it's in the moment is we, we have a term that's called man down and what happens is when we're all focused on the bird and trying to so your eyes are up to the, to the sky you know you're chasing the bird in the tree and what happens is you invariably there's a lot of guys that have run into trees we've had guys that you know i mean somersaults <laughs> you know where there's yeah. lost gear right um, right you know there's stuff spilling out of their game bag you know it, it and Usually, you know, we all take, take a quick moment of pause, make sure the guy's all right. But, you know, we see someone go down and someone yells, man down, man down, you know, and the guy comes up and he's got leaves <laughs> stuck in his hat and, uh, you know, maybe some lost gear. You know, oh, yeah. Just, that divided attention thing. Yeah. 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 So, you know, th those are usually the... You know, the <laughs> I bet that, that yeah, yeah, yeah. If you had a camera then, right? Yeah. You yeah, know? that's pretty um, funny. That's, you know, that's usually about it. I, I hate to say it. I mean, most times it's... Uh, you're just you're watching a bird. I mean, Tom Cade from the Peregrine Fund, he called it advanced bird watching. It is more than that. Um, he was a Cornell biologist. He had a lot to do with bringing the, the Peregrine back from the endangered species list. And he, he called it advanced bird watching. And, and really, in the end, you know, as far as the humor goes, it's you're, you're so immersed in it. Yeah. That right. it's, you know, I, I hate to say there's there are funny moments, but um, usually it's, it's, you know, a human being falling and tripping and ending up in, you know, a pile of mud, you know, in a salt marsh. <laughs> yeah, right, um, right. You know, there's, there's not a whole lot of talking. There's a whole lot of watching, I guess. So yeah. it doesn't always lend itself to, to funny things, but there's, there's a few. Oh yeah. I can imagine. moments in there. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's good. Um, so, uh, let me ask, I guess, um, in wrapping up, if someone was interested in falconry, you know, either listening to the podcast or something that they were considering for, you know, a, a, a period of time now, who should they reach out to? Or is there someone you would recommend they reach out to? Or what would their first steps be? Uh, yeah, call Sarah O'Reilly, the, the Great Swamp headquarters down there, um, and in, inquire with her first, which, which she'll, what they're good about is what they'll, if people are inquiring about it, they'll give someone like myself or Jack or usually Jack or I a heads up like hey I, you know I have so and so I have a, a Scott Travers who called today he's interested in falconry do you mind if I give him your number right so that's a nice little go between um, and then essentially once say myself or Jack okay like yeah sure I'll, or I'll reach or here's their information do you mind reaching out to them I'll reach out to someone mm -hmm. and there and that's where it begins but it, it could also end sometimes there because the intention or, or what I'm hearing isn't really uh, what I want to hear. He isn't really sincere interest. Yeah. yeah. It's like a passing yeah. fancy. It's more about having the bird. It's not, it, they're not well versed in like what falconry is, which is fine to a degree. But my entry point is, okay, well, why, why are you interested in it? Why do you want to do it? And point in fact, I don't care if you have or haven't hunted before, some of the most talented falconers that I know of, really, they didn't grow up deer hunting and whatnot, but they do absolutely awesome with, with their birds. They put a lot of game in the bag, which is what you, you want to do. It's a report right. card. Yeah. You're not pets and you're not pet keeping. So mm -hmm. you're trying to harvest quarry you know, for your bird. Um, and then that, that phone call will turn in. If they're saying that kind of the right thing I'm getting a good feel for, I like to meet the person, and then I'll invite them to go for a hawk walk you know, where they come out and they can see it. Because with the reading and kind of what you see on TV uh, or in magazines or whatever else, it's, it's a lot different once you get out. It's a lot harder right. than people think it is. They're seeing the aesthetics of it. I'm like, wow, this is mm, great, the bird and this. And yeah, you're out 
you're outside, it's it's great. You know, the whole the uh, the drama of it's it's awesome. I mean, it's it's all there. But then when it, you're out there, and they see that it, it's hard work. Like you're you're managing a bird and you're hunting with the bird and you're trying to, you know, I've said it before, muscle a hunt. You know, you, you're trying to keep Murphy at bay because there's you you can be in a woodlot and all of a sudden a dog comes in from nowhere and it spooks your bird and your bird's gone. Um, you can get people that come up to you. You're trying to hunt, and you, what are you doing? Why are you here? You know, well, you know, hey, I have a state, federal license. You know, so there's always variables out there. So all that being said, a, a potential apprentice needs to be around these things and, and around the hunt and around the birds and, and around just again the hunt itself because then they realize it, it, it's not you're not just calling a bird to a lure. You're right. putting that bird up and you're hunting with it. It's a it's a hunting partner. And sometimes some of these hawk walkers will say, hey, you know what? I'm glad I went for a hawk walk. It's not for me, which is good and it's honest. Uh, and then there's some that are like, no, this is exactly what I want to do and this is great. And, and in that case, then I'll, I'll say, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll agree to sponsor you and then I'll let Sarah know. And then that's that right then and there is when I s start studying. One of the first things I say is start reading. I say get yourself familiar with the sports. So then when you come for a hawk walk and I say creance, or I say, hey, lure, or, you know, the bird's a little this, it, you know, the bird's a little heavy, or, you know, all the, the nomenclature, the vocabulary that goes with the sport right. they're familiar with. So what I first try to see, just to see if they're even somewhat interested, is that, well, get yourself a couple books. And there's a, a few books out there that um, are absolutely essential. Uh, there's the B.B. and Webster book, which is North American Falconry and Hunting Hawks, that is considered the Bible of falconry. And I'll say, at least get yourself a copy of that. So we can talk falconry. And if they commit right. to that, then I'm like, all right, moving in the right direction. And then they come for hawk walks. And then what's neat is invariably you get these conversations like, hey, you know, I read this about that. Is this true? Or, hey, I read this, but this is happening different. But, you know, so it's that's where you really know that you have potentially a really good apprentice on your hands. Gotcha. And it, it really, again, it's not a passing fancy. And then it's you take the test. And then as a sponsor, you're committed to doing everything you can for that apprentice and their bird and teaching them the ways of falconry, but then teaching them success. Because again, the ultimate goal is to put quarry in the bag for your bird. And it takes a lot to get there. And rightfully so. I oh, yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of hoops. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, fantastic. Well, Jim, thank you so much for coming on the podcast this month. You're welcome. Good yeah, to this be was, here. Yeah, absolutely. This was excellent. So as always, to uh, all of our listeners, uh, if you want to reach out to me with any questions, you can always get a hold of me at scott.travers, that's T-R-A-V-E-R-S, at D-E-M dot R-I dot G-O-V. And again, please subscribe to our podcast and look forward to our next exciting episode next month. We'll have more questions from our listeners and another fantastic guest on our podcast. 